find the Gospel of Matthew, we want to find the 17th chapter, and we want to, well, actually, we want to get to the 16th chapter. Talk about the wrong placement of a chapter division. You know, they're not inspired, so uh, they were placed there. And I'm glad they're there, but sometimes I don't know why they interrupt the thought. But you have to go to the last two verses of chapter 16 before you can understand chapter 17, I think. All right, so there we are, 16, 27 through 28. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What could this mean? Some of you are standing here and you'll not taste of death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, what could that mean? Well, you know, I started this on Sunday night and I asked the people that came to Sunday night church if I should go ahead and teach this lesson to folks that come Sunday morning because it's a bit recondite, and I don't know. And they all said, yes, I should. <laughs> so it's about hermeneutics. And it's about the science of biblical interpretation. And passages like this demand proper hermeneutics. Now, just the word itself induces a spirit of somnolence. And that's, I don't want this to happen. So how do I avoid this? And the answer is, put it right at the beginning of the sermon. Maybe you'll keep them. Stay awake. Now, the book of Revelation is understood in um, four hermeneutical approaches. So I'm going to give you those. And the first is called the preterist. The preterist view is that everything book, the book of the Revelation talks about happened in, in 70 AD, including the coming of Christ, that Jesus came back. But you didn't see him because he was invisible. So that's one view. So in other words, there's nothing to look forward to in the book of the Revelation, it's all been done already. If that's the case, then we are living in the kingdom of God right now. I don't know about you, but I think in the kingdom of God, I'll be able to hear with both ears. Right? I think in the kingdom of God, I'll think clearly. I don't think I'll have a, a groaning pain when I stand up and when I sit down. I think if this is the kingdom, I'm disappointed. But preterists hold this position, and there are more of them than you think there are out there. Then there's the historical hermeneutical approach to the book of the Revelation. Events are being fulfilled through continuing church age. It's an interesting thought. There's the allegorical, that everything in the book of the Revelation is, is just a symbol. It's figurative. It doesn't really have any historical accuracy at all. I don't know what lesson it's teaching, but that's what they say. Then there's the futuristic hermeneutical approach, which is what I hold. And that is events are yet to be fulfilled in the coming age. Now I might say that there's merit in every one of those positions. And uh, I believe that when you read your Bible, especially the Old Testament prophets, that they're speaking in multi-layers, that the Bible is a dimensional book. And that it speaks for the immediate, but it also speaks almost in a paradigm. In other words, it sets a paradigm and a pattern that you can follow, and you can see it repeated through the ages, but that there's a final fulfillment. So the preterist says, well, we see so much that happened in 70 AD that everything that the Bible talks about happened in 70 AD, and so... They're very narrow in their perspective, where I'm saying, well, you know, there are some things that look like the end of the world. Nero looked like the Antichrist, uh, but he wasn't. He was what John said. John said there are many Antichrists. 
but he spoke of the Antichrist that would finally come. Now, by the way, if you want, I'm putting the, I have some old tapes here left, so I gotta get rid of them. But they're in the back. This, this is what I produced in 2012. And it's a visual account of the book of the Revelation. So all it is is my narrating the Revelation, so to speak, without much comment except for the second and third chapters. But it's a visual display of the book. So if you want, there's some back there, you can take them. If you want to put a donation, I don't really care one way or the other. Um, I think it costs about $4 or something, if I recall back then, to make the copies, that's all. But do, by all means, I'd like to get rid of whatever's left back there. I can make some more, but I, I don't know how popular it is. <laughs> At any rate, that would give these positions out. So back to preterism, this idea that it all happened in 70 AD. Well, what happened in 70 AD? Well, there was a terrible famine. You know, the one of the... Uh, uh, terrible judgments of tribulation hour is that there's going to be a worldwide famine, an economic collapse, uh, not just a Great Depression, further than anything that the world has ever seen. Uh, and that happened in 41 through uh, 54 AD in the Roman Empire. There was a terrible worldwide famine. It was very difficult, uh, especially for those that were in Jerusalem. Uh, then in 64 AD, we have uh, Nero rising to power, and he was persecuting Christians, and he burned the city of Rome. Rome was called the Eternal City. Uh, it almost looked like the end of the world. Uh, Nero certainly an a, a antichrist, so to speak. Then we have um, Titus marching on Jerusalem in 70 AD, burning the temple and routing the Jews and sending them in a dispersion throughout the Roman Empire. It was a terrible moment. It looked like the end of the world. And around 68 AD, there was the eruption of Vesuvius. And uh, Pompeii, the, uh, the citizens of Pompeii, were buried in ash suddenly. Uh, so much so that you would say this is like a grisly end. I mean, this is what the book of Revelation describes to a great degree. So one can have some sympathy with the position of the preterist. But all he was seeing was a paradigm of things to come. There is even a greater fulfillment of what they saw in the Roman Empire when it becomes a worldwide tribulation. So people like uh, the Bible Answer Man, Hank Hanegraaff holds that position, and R.C. Sproul, they both uh, uh, have Presbyterian backgrounds, and Presbyterians are Calvinists, and Calvinists tend to believe in replacement theology, and tend to believe in amillennialism. They basically think as preterists that everything happened in 70 AD, we have the uh, prophecy doesn't really mean anything to us today. And I suppose uh, they have varying views. Some of them believe that, yes, this is the kingdom. We're living in the kingdom now. And when you say, well, when did Jesus appear? Oh, well, he came, but nobody saw him or whatever invisible coming. I uh, came in spirit, uh, that sort of thing. Now, they all have uh, verses to back all this up, by the way. And there are some verses, again, that demand our attention like the one that's before us when Jesus said, some of you are standing here, you'll not see of death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So what, what could that mean? Uh, so um, Jesus also said in Matthew 24, 34, verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass till these things be fulfilled. And they love that verse in particular. Then we have uh, Matthew 23, 35, where he says that upon you may come all the righteous blood upon the earth, upon the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias, uh, the son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Revelation 1, 3, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. It was written in 96 A.D. Uh, Revelation 1, 3, the time is at hand. Behold, I come quickly. So these are the passages that they base the preterist position on. So just a word. The Bible uses the expression um, of, you know, the, something is being at hand when it really isn't immediately at hand. Isaiah 13, 6 is the destruction of Babylon. The Jews hadn't even been taken into bondage yet. They're 120 years removed from Nebuchadnezzar. And yet, the prediction is that this is what was going to happen. Babylon was going to be destroyed. 
Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, he says. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. But Isaiah is writing this in 725 B.C., and it's not until 539 B.C. that Babylon fell. And it fell to the Persians and fell rapidly to the, uh, the Persians, as a matter of fact. So even though he says the day is at hand, it was removed by 200 some years. So time is measured differently from the eternal perspective. Peter says a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years <coughs> as a day. So we have to be careful about when it says, surely I come quickly. The Lord's coming quickly. It's been 2,000 years, and he's yet to come. Now, the problem with this generation, well, you know, it's very accusative, this generation, so this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. This, Jesus says in the Olivet Discourse. So the word generation is very important. What does it mean? And so um, this generation, he says, shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Well, what things had to be fulfilled? Everything he taught in Matthew 24, the destruction of the temple, certainly, False messiahs would have to arise. Wars, ru rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, Christians hated by all nations of the earth. Uh, an apostasy, a great falling away. Gospel would be preached to every country in the world. The greatest disaster earth will ever know. Life on earth itself close to extinction. The sun would go, go black. The stars would fall from the sky. Everyone on planet earth would see Jesus coming in the clouds. The lost would be swept away in judgment. That never happened in the first century. Worse calamities than the fire of Rome have happened since. So what could Jesus mean when he said this generation shall not pass away? What could he mean when he said there's some of you standing here that will taste of death until the, you see this son of man coming in his kingdom? What could he have meant? Well, first of all, the word genia, now we have to go back and look at generation as an English, actually it's an anglicized word. It's taken directly from the Greek, genia. Genia, sorry, generation comes right there, the root. So you go back, sometimes you need to go back and to search the etymology of a word and how we got this word and what does it mean, especially when we come to a passage that seems to be somewhat ambiguous. So genia is the primary definition of, the, of this word. It's race, kind, family, stock, breed. What was Jesus saying? This people, Israel, would not pass away until all these things be fulfilled, and they haven't. And they've been the most persecuted people on earth to this day. And people like Hitler, like Stalin, tried to exterminate them, but never they failed in doing so. Because Jesus gave a promise, even though they're blinded in part, even though they have disobeyed God, even though they're responsible for crucifying their own Messiah, he promised that they would not pass away as a people till all these things be fulfilled. He made a promise to Abraham, and that covenant cannot be broken. That's what he means by this generation shall not pass away. And you can go here, of course, if you want to go to a word study, you go back in your Strong's Concordance, go back uh, to uh, word number 1074. I see you all taking notes. There'll be a test next week. And you'll find passively that that, that which has been begotten, men of the same stock, or metaphorically a race of men very like each other in endowments, pursuits, characters. So when you see the word generation, that's what it means. It doesn't mean this people right now that are living today. It means a kind of people. So, so if you're carrying a plot that said the end is near, the Preterist says, relax, it all happened in 70 AD. Now we have dominionists. Pat Robertson was one, and there were, he was probably the most, is he still alive? I think, I think he's still alive. But um, you have a dominion theology today, and, the, and they teach this concept that we're, we're living in the millennium, this is the kingdom, and uh, it's total nonsense, um, as far as I'm concerned. We could get into this, but that would be more hermeneutics. Let's get back to the text. So what did he mean when he said this? Well, I think I have an answer to this. Some of you, not all of you, he says some of you. So to whom was he speaking? Of whom was he speaking? I think in particular, John and Peter. How did John see the coming of the Son of Man before he died? 
And the answer is the book of the Revelation. He saw Jesus in his glory. He saw him in his kingdom. He saw him and he saw all the details of how he would return to earth in Revelation 19 on a white stallion with a sword coming forth. And even in Revelation 12, he describes it. I heard a loud voice saying, in heaven now is come salvation, the strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. So I would have to say that John was certainly what Jesus meant. You're not going to die until you see it. And Peter, Peter, James, and John for that matter, which leads us to this curious connection between the end of chapter 16 and the beginning of chapter 17. If there was no chapter division, the Bible explains itself. Jesus said, some of you will not until you see me coming in my kingdom. And what did they see thereafter? Peter, James, and John saw Jesus in his glory. They saw him in his resurrected form as he will come back to earth with two prophets, Moses and Elijah. Peter would later write about this in his epistle. He said, we've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we received the, uh, he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Peter now later writes about the event of seeing Jesus in his glory, the transfiguration, which leads us to the 17th chapter in the first verse. So after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, and he bringeth them unto an high mountain apart. Mountains in the Bible are symbolic of the kingdom. Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, didn't he? And he preached the principles of the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. There's is the kingdom of God. Blessed are the uh, meek. They shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they that mourn. They shall be comforted. Blessed and so on. All the blessings of that kingdom. So he takes them to a high mountain again. Uh, after this in Matthew 24, he takes them to the Mount of Olives. And gives them the lesson about the end of the world. Uh, when he's going to give about the secret dispensation that we're now living in. He takes them to the upper room and speaks of the Holy Ghost. So, six days Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John. They go up to a high mountain. So I have it underlined for this reason. What mountain was it? Well, the Bible doesn't say. So it's all conjecture at this point. There's some that say, well, the highest mountain of all, up to the north, Mount Hermon. But you'd have to have um, skis, and it's hard to get up there. It's snow-capped all year round. It's the highest point uh, in all of uh, Israel, and it's snow capped. It's very interesting. Uh, it melts, it forms a little lake uh, below, which is called the Sea of Galilee, which lets out into the river called the River Jordan, which finally deposits uh, down into the Dead Sea, the lowest place on earth. If you will, geographically, topographically, you have heaven and hell. You have the high peaks of heaven itself, the snow-capped mountain of Hermon, you have a single river of life in Jesus. If you drink of that water, you shall never thirst. But if not, it will proceed down to a type of hell, the Dead Sea, the lowest place, sea level on earth. It's an amazing story, but we're not talking about that this morning. Don't think it was Mount Hermon. Think it was probably Mount Tabor, probably the same mountain he preached the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but it doesn't say so we have to guess but probably Mount Tabor at any rate he takes with him Peter, James and John this holy triumvirate uh, he takes them with him now why? Uh, well he, they, they'll, they'll form a witness there's a uh, Deuteronomic law in chapter 19 that the mouth of two uh, or three witnesses shall every matter be established it's the law of corroboration exists today in our judicial system. You have to have witnesses. You can't just be making claims. So uh, it comes from the Mosaic law, the idea of two or three witnesses, corroboration. So he takes with him three. He's got three that will corroborate what they're about to see. But there's something about Peter, James, and John. Are, are they special? Are, did they have a, does Jesus love them more than the others? 
becomes a question because he seems to take them in these special occasions. Remember when Jairus comes and says, my daughter is sick, she's, she's dying, you have to come and help. And uh, while he's pleading with Jesus, a man comes and says, don't bother the master, she's dead already. And a moan comes up from the crowd and uh, the rabbi loses his, his spirit and Jesus said, she's not dead, she's sleeping. And he goes to the house and they're mourning and they're singing songs, woeful songs of grief. And Jesus said, I tell you, she's just sleeping and I've come to awaken her. And they mocked him. And Jesus went into the death chamber. He took the mother, he took the father, and he took Peter, James, and John. That would mean seven people in the room, right? So, <laughs> and he says, Talitha Kumai, and brings that woman, that 12-year-old daughter, back to life. Peter, James, and John, why were they selected to see such a miracle? I don't know. I guess they were favored. When Jesus is about to enter into his passion, and it begins at Gethsemane, where blood comes out of him, he takes with him Peter, James, and John. He places them strategically at a stone's throw distance from him. They can be witnesses of what passion and agony Jesus is about to go through, as the devil does all that he can to kill him at Gethsemane. So they came to the place which was called Gethsemane, and he taketh with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. So, so this, this triumvirate seems to have been selected in a very special way. I think they had more love for Jesus than the others. I don't think Jesus plays favorites. I think you can be a Peter, a James, or a John. It's all up to how close you want to be to him. How close do we want to be to the Lord? That's the Peter, James, and John crowd. So let's all pledge to be that close to the master. That we might even as John lay our head upon the divine breast and hear the eternal heartbeats of the Savior of man. In verse 2, he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. When Jesus comes back in his kingdom, that's how he's coming. Amen. He's coming back with an effulgent light, a light so powerful, so penetrating, that his enemies will melt before him. Amen. Now, he's coming back with us, and I guess we're going to help him. I don't know, what, what are we going to do? We're Barney Fife. And uh, Andy says, keep the bullet in your pocket. We won't need your help on this one. He's coming back in a transfigured form. Now, of course, here he's transfigured. Because now, flesh and blood, that's all Jesus came like us. That he might identify with us. He came in a lowly form. He took on this tabernacle of flesh, this temporarity. The eternal becomes temporary, all for us. Satan attacks him and, and, and pelts him for 40 days and 40 nights. He's hungered, he's thirsty, he's tired, he's tempted, but he never yields even once to the devil. He does all this for us. He even experiences death. The pseudo-intellectual Gnostics of the first three centuries said, nah, God could never become flesh. And so they rejected Christ as being God in the flesh. But I tell you, the Bible's clear, God was manifest in the flesh, it says in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, 1 Timothy 3.16. All right, so here he's transfigured for a moment now. He's not just what he was, now he's in a glorified, the way he will be when he returns in glory. His face is shining like the sun, Revelation chapter one. Such glory. Look at these passages. This is who Jesus is. They shall see his face. His name shall be on their foreheads. Revelation 1.16, in his right hand, seven stars out of his mouth, a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. 
Malachi says, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And even Paul says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. This word, transfigured, again, we can go back and look at the rootings and the etymology. It's a fascinating work. Meta, morphuo. So you hear meta. Meta is uh, anything that's meta, metaphysical, is above the physical nature. Meta. It means to, ch to uh, morphuo means to change, to change. Uh, so we think of metamorphosis, a change. If you put the two together now, it's a conflation of two words, metamorphuo. So it's changed into a higher form. So, so that's, that's exactly what happens there, transformation. This word is also used when it speaks to the believer in Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye metamorphuo, transfigured, transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Oh, yes. You and I are to bear his image, even while we're here in this tabernacle of flesh. And we don't do it very well, do we? But it, have you ever run into someone and you know immediately they're Christians? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know they're Christians. Amen. Now, how can you know that? There's a glory about them. There, there's something different about them. It's their countenance. It's their speech. It's their deportment. It's still just a body, though. But God invites us to be transfigured internally. A new spirit lives inside of us. And one day, we'll be glorified like Jesus. Our body will be transfigured. Amen. So, same word there, transfigured, metamorphuo. It's an interesting word. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, I call it the one-step program. So if you're a drunk, you can be saved. You say, well, I'll go to the program. I, it won't help you. They go back, uh, keep going into the program. I don't know how many people have been through the program. They've been in, through it and go right back to drink and to drugs. Uh, you need something. I said, here's my one-step program. Try this one. This one works. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Amen? Amen. I, I can't hear you. Amen. Okay. Yeah, and my wife said, I'm speaking too loud. Am I speaking too loud? No. Oh, okay. She, she might need a hearing aid, too. I don't much quite sure. So the Spirit comes and transforms us, doesn't he? He lives inside of us. It's a new birth. We're different now. And, uh, and we're not what we're going to be, by the way. Uh, God's still working on us, isn't he? You know, he's kind of chiseling at us. Michelangelo was the famous... Uh, a painter of the Sistine Chapel, I guess that's how he's best known, but really he was a sculptor, the Pieta, uh, uh, Moses. He, he sculpted the, uh, these, these glorious things out of marble. He could see a slab of marble, and he would take his hammer and his chisel. If any of you have ever tried chiseling, I've, I've done that. I'm a chiseler from way. At any rate, I've, you know, I've worked with Block a little bit, and and sometimes you need a half block or you need something. So you, you take your chisel and your hammer, you go all the way around the block like this, and then you break it very slowly. And hopefully it breaks it half, often doesn't. But imagine taking marble and chipping at it and making a statue. But they say he could see David in the marble. He could see uh, the virgin uh, in, the, uh, in the marble that he would chisel. God's chiseling, little by little, smoothing us and making us after the image of his own son. Uh, he's not done yet. Uh, he's got a lot more work with me. How about you? There's a lot more to do. John writes, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it doth not yet appear what we shall be. No, no, there's more to it, right? He's not done with us. Because when he shall appear, we shall be like him. 
for we shall see him as he is. Amen. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Amen. Just being in church today will change you. Maybe briefly, but it will change you, I tell you. You'll go out lighter than you came in here. Amen. You will go out closer to God than you came in here. And so the devil's got his work. And believe me, he'll be working on you as soon as you leave here to see if he can maybe scrub some of that out of you and put the old filth and dirt back in you. We all with open face, beholding as in a glass. It's just a symbol. You're beholding as in a glass. And what are you reading? The glory of the Lord. You're reading about the glory of the Lord right now in 17, 2, transfigured. You read of the glory of the Lord and you are changed into the same image from glory to glory, Amen. even as by the Spirit of the Lord. God's transforming you as I'm speaking. Amen. His word is doing the work. Now, everybody should bring their Bible to church. You should all have your Bibles, and you should have your Bibles open. And you should have a pen or a pencil available so you can underline something that speaks to you, and so you can go back later and read it again. Now, I put it up here on the screen because I move too fast. I understand that. We've got a lot to cover. But you want to be transformed, and when you're reading your Bible, you want to be transformed. And when you read it, you say, Lord... I need to change about this anger thing, right? I'm reading about it here. It says, be ye angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. I let all anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with, with all malice, and be kind one to another, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You read it and say, Lord, I've got some work here. Your spirit has to change me. I'm not given to this naturally. And, uh, and God will change you from the glory that you read to the actual glory in your own heart. And your life will change. And you'll be so much better. You know, they have anger management classes. These guys at the jail tell me, you know, the court, they uh, assigned them to anger management class. You know, and they sit there. Uh, they have to pay $1,000. And they sit there. And, and the teacher says, now, you feel like getting angry. Count to 10 backwards, you know, 10, 9, 8, <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of help, isn't it? Or they'll t send you to the psychiatrist, and he'll say, you've got to take this drug right here, and it'll, it'll calm you, right? And, and it'll, you know, and you'll be limp all day long like that and so forth. Uh, but it, the, the drug will wear off, then what? You need something that really does work. Amen. Well, what works? Jesus. The spirit of Christ, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the gentleness, the goodness, the faith, the meekness, and the temperance that the Holy Spirit will bring to you. We need all of that. Amen. I'm glad you're all with me. I think I heard some people in my right ear. So, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, or Elijah. Elias talking with him. What? What were they witnessing? What were they seeing? Why were they seeing what they were seeing? What could it mean? These two prophets will be speaking to Jesus about his coming. Peter, James, and John were asleep through some of it. When I get to heaven, I'm going to say, what were you doing? You know, there was more to, to know, and you weren't hearing it all. But uh, I have compassion on them because... We could all fall asleep. They were in, had just climbed a mountain. So in a sense, they were innervated. You know, they came up, you get up to a certain point, and they went to sleep. I'm thinking they might have had a little lunch too, and that will aid, <laughs> right? They were in the land of Nod. I do know this, Moses and Elijah are making another appearance. That's for sure. Well, Elijah, for sure, Malachi says that. Moses has to be the other one. They say, no, no, it's Enoch. Because Enoch didn't really die. He was raptured up. 
and Elijah didn't die, he was taken up. So it is appointed unto man wants to die, so they have to be the ones that are the two witnesses in Revelation 11. The only problem with that is the rapture of the church is going to take place and there's going to be millions, I hope, of Christians that won't die. They'll be raptured up just like Enoch was. So I think Moses is a better candidate. Why? Because they're at the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. And what are they talking about? What he's about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So these have power. In Revelation we find them in the 11th chapter. These have power. They're coming back ahead of Jesus. And they're coming back to win their Jewish compatriots to Jesus Christ. And they'll demonstrate by signs and wonders. These have power to shut heaven. And these are malevolent signs. Okay. And uh, shut heaven so it rains not in the days of their prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood. Didn't Moses do that? And to smite the earth with all plagues. Didn't Moses do that? Didn't Elijah do that? as often as they will. So uh, they're coming back. So they're on the mount with Jesus. Remember the uh, Deuteronomic principle, two or three witnesses. And so they're there as well. Now we got the, we've got two witnesses and Jesus in a heavenly beatific form. And we have Peter, James, and John in the temporal form. It's interesting. So. Why Moses and Elijah? Well, they clearly represent the law. Moses is the lawgiver of the Old Testament. He receives the commandments from the Lord. So he's 40 days and 40 nights in the presence of Almighty God. He comes back with his face shining with the glory of God. Elijah, he's, he is the main prophet of the Old Testament, though he doesn't write a word. He's an oral prophet. But he's known as the king of all the prophets, Elijah. We know Elijah has to come back because Malachi, the last prophecy of your Bible, uh, Old Testament, is the coming of the son of righteousness. But preceding him will come Elijah, it says. So it's pretty easy to figure it out in Revelation 11. So who are the two witnesses? It's uh, Moses and Elijah. Both represented the law and the prophets. Both were prophets. Both destroyed enemies with fire. Uh, both brought plagues to the nation. Both stood with Christ at the transfiguration. And both were made, made mysterious departures at death. Moses, if you recall, was buried somewhere in a strange place, right? But nobody knows where he was buried. And there was a fight over his body. The devil wanted it. <laughs> Michael came to the rescue. All right, you still with me? Is this too abstruse, too difficult? See, the people at night think maybe this is too hard for the people in the morning. I, don't, I have to set them straight here tonight. You don't want me to hold anything back, do you? Of course, you could come at night, too, and then you'd be part of the scholastic group, right? Wouldn't hurt you. I'll be here. And behold, there appeared unto the Moses and Elijah talking with him. And he said, what were they talking about? Well, Luke tells us what they were talking about. Behold, it said they, they talked with him, but he spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. They knew. The law and the prophets witnessed that Jesus would have to die on the cross in a prescribed manner. All these Old Testament prophecies are little pieces of a giant prophetic puzzle. It is our glad task to try to take those pieces and put them together. So I was preaching at LGAR, right, Naomi, remember? And that lady came up and she said, uh, oh, come over. You have to see what I'm working on. And she had a jigsaw puzzle. And she had, I think it was 500-piece puzzle, and she had... It was half assembled, but she was so proud of it, you know. And I looked at that puzzle and I thought, you know, I don't have the patience to do a crossword puzzle or a uh, jigsaw puzzle. I can't do that. You have to be able to take that piece and look at it and say, here's where it belongs, right? I'll take it, put it here and say, it doesn't belong there. 
now it does. Works just fine. <laughs> but with the Bible, you have to take the pieces, the prophetic pieces, and you assemble them bit by bit. Here it is in Psalms. Here it is in Isaiah. Here's a word in Deuteronomy. And you put them all together, and the composite picture is Jesus the Lord. But you see, we have it all put together. It's called the New Testament. There's still some mystery left, but most of those pieces fit so beautifully together that there is no man in the world that could have manufactured this book. No. When they say, oh, it was written by men, well, I said, you know, they should have disguised it better because they actually put their names on it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, you know, I said, <laughs> Samuel. I said, I guess they weren't hiding it. No, the Bible says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That's how you get the Bible. Yeah, God uses men, but they're just his pen. The Holy Spirit is the writer. Right? Amen. What were they talking about? They were talking about what Jesus had told them. Jesus had told them already, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be raised on the third day. We just discussed it in the 16th <coughs> chapter, didn't we? A, few, a week ago, two weeks ago. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem to suffer many things of the elders and priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. He was prepping them for what was going to happen, but they weren't hearing it. I, we could, there, in other places in John 10, or Mark 10, it says the same thing. How many times did he tell them? Maybe every day he was trying to tell them. What he was doing is tamping down their expectations because they expected that he was coming in as a king and that they were going to be in the cabinet and they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest and who was going to get to be the secretary of state and who was going to be secretary of defense and he can be the secretary of agriculture over there, right? And he can be the mayor of Wilkins Township, but you know. <laughs> you see, let, Jesus told them, and he'll tell them again here in Matthew, let these sayings sink down into your ears. The Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. They didn't know what it What's he talking about? But Jesus said a lot of things that they didn't understand. And uh, they dared not ask and say, what do you mean by this? You're going to die. You're the king, immortal, eternal. You're bringing an eternal kingdom. <laughs> they didn't understand. And that's why when Jesus was crucified, you don't find any of them at the cross. They all ran and hide. They were all hiding. John's the only one that's there. And other, uh, the, the rest of them are somewhere at a distance looking and watching the scene from a distance lest they should be identified with the crucified Messiah. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. So they slept through some of this. Like I said, you know, I'm a little upset. What, what are they doing to sleep? They should have been taking notes. But then I think that of you sometimes. When I look out and see people, at first I said, look at them, diligently praying for their pastor. <laughs> but when I see them going, then I know they're not praying, they're sleeping. And I have sympathy on you. It's hard to sit and listen for an hour. That's hard to do. I know that. And if you're on medication, it's even harder. And if I'm teaching on hermeneutics, you're really in trouble. <laughs> I think it's the 13th. It's, it's, it's one of the commandments, isn't it? The 13th. And that is thou shalt not bore. I don't want to be boring. To me, the Bible is exciting. And learning it should be a thrill. But I know that there are people that can make it boring, and I don't want to be one of them. God help me, right? You know, they slept at Gethsemane, too. He took Peter, James, and John up there, and, and when he came back, they're sleeping. He said, watch and pray with me. 
This was an hour of tremendous need for Jesus. Where was his support? He was alone. He was alone in his sufferings. The people that should have been there at Gethsemane failed him. And uh, when he rose up from prayer, he came to his disciples. He found them all sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptations. Is the church asleep today? I fear so. You can get all upset if you want with the liberals and what they're doing to this country. And it is upsetting. There is no doubt in my mind. We have anger in our hearts towards what these people are doing and how they're changing the culture. But I don't blame them. They're evil and they're wicked and they're lost. So was I. How about you? I can't blame them. I blame the church. Didn't Jesus say, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost his savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. I don't want to be good for nothing. I want to be good for something. I want to be a preserving element. I want to be a light to a dark world. I don't want to be asleep while the devil's out sowing tares amongst the wheat. How about you? Amen. My lesson on Bible sleepers. He returned and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Neither wist they what to answer him, nor will we. If, if we stand before God at the judgment, as you will, as I will, the beam of seat judgment, we'll have to answer to God why we missed church, why we weren't studying our Bibles, why we weren't a good witness, why we were doing a thousand things we knew were wrong. Why? You have to give an answer. And they wish not what to answer. We don't have an answer. What can we say? Every mouth shall be stopped. We'll become guilty before God. Remember Jonah? Eh, Jonah, he's a backslider. God said, go preach to the Ninevites. I hate them. I don't want to preach to them. They hate us. They're our enemies. It's hard to pray for our enemies. When's the last time you prayed for the president? You see, we don't want to do that. But we're supposed to. Jesus showed us by his own example. When's the last time we prayed for Hamas? Or, or any of the uh, Arabs? You know, I'm going to introduce uh, tonight, uh, we may bring on another missionary. Uh, I'll find out. I have to interview him to see where he's coming from. But uh, he works in Lebanon and Egypt. He's doing what he can to get the gospel to the people of the Middle East. It's a bold ministry. It truly is. So I want to know more about him, but we may be supporting him. and I, You'll want to be a part of that. I would think you would want to be a part of something like that and support uh, that effort. They're our enemies. They need to be converted. All the Bible tells us Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of the truth. And I speak this to your shame. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. There it is. There's the devil sitting right next to us, right? Satan is never too busy to rock the cradle of a sleeping Christian. <laughs> He'll keep us asleep if he can. Well, slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep. And an idle soul shall suffer hunger. <laughs> Not slothful in business, Romans tells us, right? Well, wait a minute. Mm. You remember the parable. It's found in Matthew 25. It's part of the Olivet Discourse. The women were waiting for the bridegroom to come. And um, they had a lamp, but they had, they had oil in it. But they said, well, you know, the, the ones didn't bring much oil. Five of them said, we're running out of oil. And they said to the, the wise that had the extra oil, give us some of yours. No, 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 no. You, you've got to have your own oil. Don't count on mine. Go get it for yourself. So the five went running back to town to get oil. And when they came back, the bridegroom had come. 
and the five wise that had full lamps went into the bride chamber with the bridegroom, and the door was shut. And the five foolish came pounding at the door, Lord, Lord. They knew him by name. And from within the voice said, I know you not whence ye are. Didn't open the door. It's a scary passage. Let's not be found asleep, folks. Let's be wide awake. We need to understand what the devil's doing, by the way. If you're a parent in particular, or if you're a grandparent, these kids need our help. They're going to need our support. This is a crazy world. Do you know what they're teaching these kids in these schools? It's antichrist. You, you and I have a task, a tall task before us here. And I'm going to tell you what, the devil will put you to sleep on this one. What you permit, what you allow, and so on. You know, how, everything's more important than church, I can tell you that right now. They have football practice, they have wrestling, they have uh, uh, soccer, I don't, bingo, I don't know what they're doing. Anything but, but getting kids to church, no, no, we can't, you know, you can't do that. They're brainwashed. What do we get them, an hour? What they, the rest of the world has them. The TV has them. Those, uh, those perverted cartoons teaching them the occult and everything else. And parents don't even know what it's all about. You better not be asleep on this one, folks. Your, your heart will break, I'm telling you. Amen. Your kids go to the drugs and go to the foolishness and die a drug death, death and so forth. You'll be weeping and wondering what you did wrong. Why wonder then when you can wonder now and get your eyes open and say, look, I, I need to understand what's going on here. The devil's not getting my child. That's how I looked at it. Not having my child. Nope. We're going to close the door and lock it. He's not getting in. Sounds pretty radical. Well, there are other churches. Go to other churches where they'll put you to sleep. Everything's okay. Everything's fine. You know, don't worry about anything. Just be like the world and so forth. And dress like the world. Talk like the world. Go to all the movies of the world. Do, do all the things that the world does. And what are, we, what are we producing? Knowing the time. Do you know what time it is? Don't look at your watch now. I might pull a Sunday school on you here. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. So we've got to put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light, Romans 13 tells us. We've got to be vigilant and sober. We, we're children of the day. We're not of the night. You were sometimes of the darkness, but now you're of the light. Uh, walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which they do in the dark. But all things are reproved by the light. And whatsoever doth make manifest is light, wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Amen. Lord, help us. Amen. Here we are, Lord. If we're asleep, then waken us, Lord. And help us to be fully aware. We think of those three, Peter, James, and John. We'd have to think uh, of the 12, they were of the holiest. And yet asleep at such a critical moment as this. How much of the conversation did they miss? But Lord, uh, help us not to be missing anything. Help us to have all bases covered, Lord. And give us a, 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 a longing for the word, a, a thirst and a hunger for righteousness. Help us, Lord, to see through the machinations of the evil one, the devil, and what he's, what he's trying to do to us, what he's trying to do to our families. And let us stand, having done all to stand. I pray, Father, for the blessings to come to us. Transform us. Transfigure us, Lord. Help us to be filled with that spirit. James says, the spirit that dwelleth in you lusteth to envy. It wants first place. I pray, Lord, that not the spirit of the world, but the spirit of God would have first place in our heart and our life. If God is speaking to you this morning, you need to come to the altar, you need to do it. Let's stand together. And if God is speaking to you, get here to the altar, kneel down, pray, 
seek the Lord. Confess your uh, need. If you're not saved, don't leave here unsaved. What a foolish thing. Christ went to the cross to shed his blood to save you. To bring you to eternal life. Give him your heart today. Live for him the rest of your life. Show him your devotion. Put down the things of a temporal world and take up the cross and follow him. You'll never regret it. So Lord, we come to the end here this morning and we're grateful for what lessons we can learn. And we certainly haven't even touched the surface of this transfiguration. There's much that we must cover, Lord. Help us to do that tonight. Bring a blessing to all here, Lord. We thank you for the, the great way that you have helped us, Lord. Your benevolent hand upon us in so many ways, Lord. Thank you for eternal life and the hope of heaven. Thank you, Lord, for the fact that we can ambulate, we can get to church, we can come here, Lord, fellowship. We have uh, health to whatever degree we have it, Lord. We're grateful. These are all gifts from above. Every good gift, every perfect gift has come from the Father of lights. We bless you. We thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to accept the plan of salvation that God has laid forth from the foundations of the earth. And the first point of that plan is that all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So begin by confessing your sin before God, that you have sinned against Him. and You can't even recollect all of the times that you've offended Him. He has the record, and that record needs to be expunged. Secondly, it's important to know that God will punish sin. If it goes without atonement, we will pay the ultimate price. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that eternal price is hell, fire, and brimstone. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. But Jesus paid the price and made the atonement on the cross. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When Jesus died, he said, it is finished. He made an end to our damnation and our debt that we owed to him, paid by his own blood and justifies us before a holy God. On the third day, in triumph, Jesus rises from the dead. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So call upon him today. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation.